Welcome everyone and thank you for coming to join me for the afternoon. My name is Ellen Grove. I am an Agile coach from Ottawa, Canada and I'm thrilled to be back at India after, in Agile India after being away for a couple of years. Um, what we're going to do during our time together today is this is a workshop to explore the, the, the art of humble inquiry, which in my mind and in my experience is actually one of the most important leadership skills. Um, just to the people who are coming in now, if, you, if there is room at a table, please join the table because this is a very interactive workshop. I am not going to talk at you very much. Most of the action is going to happen in conversation at the table. Um, so if there's a spot at the table, great. For the people who end up in chairs, we will make sure that you have materials to work with each other. I'll just send some handouts back because you might want these over the course of the talk. So if I can just get these passed to the back of the room, can I? That would be fantastic. We'll pass those around. So, so this is really a workshop about learning to ask great questions. Because one of the fundamental shifts in how we approach leadership as we move to working in an agile way is it's much less about telling people what to do because we're dealing with complex situations and things are changing all the time. Um, and it's more learning how do, we, how do we ask better questions of the people we work with, of the people who work for us, so that we can achieve better outcomes together. In a, this workshop, we're going to explore how that helps you to achieve better outcomes. We're going to talk about what, we're going to practice some skills to explore what less telling and more asking really looks like. And we're going to talk about why this is so hard to do, because this is very counterintuitive to the way that we have been conditioned to work successfully. So. But also, I'm not going to do a lot of the talking in this, in this session. As I said, this is where most of the action is going to happen in conversation between you at the tables. And where I'd like to begin with that is I'd like you to find a partner in the room, somebody sitting at your table or somebody sitting next to you if you're sitting at the chair or uh, maybe sitting along the wall. And I'm going to give you about two minutes. You get 60 seconds each. And I would like you to share with the person next to you what drew you to this workshop. Okay, I'm going to give you, I'll let these people come in and then I'll explain again what we're going to do and then I'll give you two minutes to do that. So, come on in and grab a space. If you can find a space at a table, even better. Um, for the people who are standing along the wall along that side, maybe if I could uh, just put some handouts here, if I could ask you to pass them back to the people who are lined up along the wall. So now your task at the moment is to find a partner at your table and spend 60 seconds each explaining what attracted you to this workshop. Your two minutes for that starts now. Okay, that's been 60 seconds. If your partner hasn't had a chance to talk, switch roles. Okay, time is up. Just let's see how many people know this because with the number of people in the room, we're going to, yeah. I'm going to need, with the number of people in this room, I'm going to need to use this signal. And what this means is some people have already gathered is if I put my hand up, that's your signal to put your hand up and finish your sentence and stop talking because that way we can bring focus back quickly to the middle of the room. So now what I'd like you to do is think about this little exchange that you've had. And, um, you might want to grab a sticky or a piece of note paper if you have one. And I want you to think, a couple, uh, think for your, a moment about what your experience as a listener was like right there. What did you do as a listener? Were you looking for what connections you had with the, the person you were speaking with? Were you, did they identify a problem? And did you immediately start thinking about how can I solve their problem or can, how can I help them solve their problem? Take a moment and capture your reflections on a sticky or organize your thoughts in your head.
Ja. So. And, uh, okay. And, uh, and once you've made the notes, made your notes or collected your thoughts, take a moment to share with your partner what that experience of listening was like. What was it like for you to listen? And I'll give you about a minute for that, just so you know. Okay, so hopefully you've had a moment to re reflect on what that experience of listening was like. Because listening is one of the key skills in humble inquiry. Part of it is about asking questions, but the other half of asking questions, of course, is listening to the answers, right? And humble inquiry, what is humble inquiry? This comes from Edgar Schein's book, Humble Inquiry, which I cannot recommend enough. I am, uh, I was blown away by this book. It's very short, it's very quick to read, and it very quickly and cleanly explains so many things about how do we shift our behavior from a culture of telling, of expecting that when we're in a leadership role, one of our primary functions is telling people what to do, to being in a leadership stance where we recognize that we are dependent on other people to work together to solve problems. And one of the ways we can best support that is by relationship building and learning to ask better open questions and listening very carefully to the answers. So humble inquiry, as Shine defines it, is the fine art of drawing someone out of asking questions to which you do not already know the answer, and of building a relationship that is based of, on curiosity and interest in the other person. And this, this, is, this is a wildly different thing because we live in a very problem-solving culture, very task-focused culture, and we tend to value telling over asking because we tend to believe that task we're, our workplaces are often built around an assumption that task accomplishment is more important than relationship building. And Shine is turning that idea on his head. He's saying that in order to be effective, to work together well, to solve <coughs> complex problems, we really need to focus on building relationships with the people who we work with so that we can work, to, we recognize our interdependence regardless of where we are in the organization and we learn to work together more effectively. So why? why? Why does this work? Because this stance of approaching other people with curiosity, of asking questions, of really listening, it helps, it empowers the other person in the conversation, first of all. If somebody comes along and I tell you what to do, you're not necessarily going to feel like you have much autonomy or much agency. You're just taking orders and it's like, yeah, maybe I'll do what you want. Maybe I won't. Um, but it's not necessarily conducive to a feeling of mutual respect, right? Um, and conversations that are focused on building relationships rather than directing people or telling people through, especially through questions that are really designed to tell rather than ask. Um, conversation that builds relationship, it's more equitable, it's more balanced, it helps us treat each other with respect and recognizing that we are in fact dependent on each other to get things done we need to do. And that builds trust. And one of the things that in my experience as an Agile coach, that it really is fundamental. If we want to have effective teams, if we want to have effective organizations, we need to build trust amongst the people we work with in order to be effective at solving complex problems. So this is, this is where learning to ask better questions and learning to listen is a critical leadership skill. So let's talk about listening for a moment. We did a little exercise at the beginning of this workshop where you listened to each other, maybe. Because a lot of the times when we're listening, we're not really listening. We're kind of listening to, what, with, to one ear to what people are saying, but a lot of the time we're often thinking about, well, what am I gonna say next? Just quick show of, quick show of hands. Hands up if, when you were reflecting on your experience as a listener, if you were, start, if you were thinking more about well, what am I going to say when it's my turn to talk? Anybody feel that way? Yeah. Or somebody identified a problem 
and you jumped right into, wow, I have ideas about how you might solve your problem. Does that seem familiar? We've trained ourselves to listen that way. And so the first step we need to take in order to be able to more consciously and intentionally assuming a stance of humble inquiry is to train ourselves to really listen. And um, from, from the coactive coaching model, there's a model of, they talk about the three level of listening, three levels of listening, and I want to share this with you because I found this a really powerful tool. If any of you have heard Lisa Atkins talk, she talks about this quite a lot, and this is where I got this exercise from her. So we're all going to do something faintly ridiculous together. So the three levels of listening, the first level is internal listening, where yeah, I'm kind of listening to you, but really I've got the internal dialogue going on in my head. I'm either thinking, oh, okay, I heard them say that, and this is what I'm going to say next when it's my turn to talk, or I'm not even listening at all. You're talking, 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 telling me about something that really matters to you, and I'm thinking about, wow, I wonder if I'm going to be on time for that meeting, or I need to pick up groceries on the way home, or whatever. This is internal listening, which is all focused, me, 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 me. I might be looking at you, I might be pretending to listen, I'm not really taking in what you're saying. Level two listening is focused listening where I am listening to you. I am paying intent attention to what's going on. And that's, that's great, that's a step up. That's where I'm, I am attending to what you're saying. But I might be so focused that actually I'm missing some of the things that are going on contextually in the conversation. And that's where we move to level three listening. Level three listening, according to this active listening model, is listening in such a way that I'm listening to you, but I'm also paying attention to what's going on around us. I'm not just taking in your words, but I'm taking in your body language. I'm taking in what the mood is in the room. I'm paying attention to what's going on around us. And that's giving me all the information I need to really be able to relate to you. And that's what humble inquiry is about. That's what active listening is about. That's what humble inquiry is about. Really relating to other people, building that relationship. And I found a great, it doesn't come from the coactive model, but I found a great definition of what this level three listening is from a book about communication by the actor Alan Alda, of all people. The guy who was in MASH and West Wing and stuff. And it, in addition to being an actor, he's very interested in uh, communicating about sciences and helping scientists learn to communicate more effectively. I can't remember the title of the book, but he talks about relating as it's being so aware of the other person that even if you have your back to them, you're observing them. It's letting everything about them affect you, not just your, their words, but their tone of voice, their body language, even subtle things like where they're standing in the room or how they occupy a chair. Relating is letting all of that seep into you and have an effect on how you respond to the other person. That's level three listening. It's taking all of that in. And now this is the ridiculous part of this because I really want you to remember this model. So we're going to do this silly little exercise that's going to help you remember the difference between level one, level two, level three. I'm going to ask everybody in the room to stand up. So if you'll remember from the model, level one listening is me. Me, 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 me. So I want you to do this. Me, 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 me. Everybody, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, awesome. This is stupid and silly, but the reason that I'm asking you to do this is because if you want things to stick in your memory, it helps to engage your body because that creates different neural pathways to remember things. And emotion helps you remember things as well. So everybody's feeling kind of funny, this is goofy and it's a little embarrassing. You'll remember this more than if I just sat and said, this is level one, this is level two, this is level three, moving on. So moving on to level two, you, 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 you. This is level two, you, 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 you. Okay, and level three, this global listening is us. It's all about us, so open your arms wide to take in everything about us. Okay, so let's just do that really quickly. Level one, me, 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 me. Level two, you, 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 you. Level three, us. Okay, thank you, you can sit down now. So, 
Now that you've learned a little bit about listening and you've thought a little bit more carefully about what listening involves, I want to redo the exercise we did at the beginning of this workshop where I want you to think about a problem that you're involved in and I want you to find a partner, maybe the same partner you worked with before, and I'm going to give you 60 seconds each to talk about the problem. What I would like you to do if you, when you're listening, is just listen. Don't, don't, like, don't like strive to, oh my god, I have to listen to level three all the way through this. Mm -hmm. Listen as you naturally would, but just kind of notice where, when am I listening at level one? When am I listening at level two? When am I listening at level three? And what drops me in and out of that? Because the expectation isn't that I'm that hyper-focused all the time. That would take an incredible amount of energy and willpower. But I just want you to pay attention to the level that you're listening at. So think of a problem that you're willing to discuss with another person in the room. And then I'm going to give you 60 seconds each to talk to that person. And as you're listening, just note what level are you listening at. OK? Go. OK, that's been about a minute. I'd ask you to switch roles now and let the other person speak. Okay. Oh, no, come on in. Come on in. So. Okay. If I can. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So. How did it feel to really be listened to? What was the difference that you noticed between the first round of listening and this round of listening? Sorry? It's quite effective. It's quite effective, yeah. Yeah. How, how did it feel to be listened to with intention like that? You said it's effective. How, how did you feel about it? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And I just want to highlight, this is perfectly natural. The expectation, I, I don't know, maybe there are people who can do it who are like, I am at level three listening all the time and I'm taking it all in. But naturally you will drop between those things. But as you recognize what the different levels are, it increases your ability to think, wow, I, I just noticed I'm not really paying attention. I need, I need to tune into this conversation. I really need to take in what's going on. How did it, how, what was your experience? Uh, what other experience did you have as a listener this the time around? The first one we were probably doing as a more of exercise. And mm -hmm. we were literally like leaning in right? yeah. more, right? less than you and all that. But in the second exercise, we were slightly tense towards you, uh, us part actually. Right? We were mm -hmm. listening, we were collaborating very well. Right? So that was the major difference. Yeah, and as you were being listened to that way, how did it feel different? So when she talked about her problem, that I relate that is with, with the my problem. So that was the relation we listen and we really think about that we consider as the right relation. Excellent. So so you you she was describing your problem, and you started to think about oh, I have some similar problems to that. I can understand that. I can empathize with that. That's, and I realize I'm putting some words around what you said, but this is it, right? We want to, through listening, we want to start building relationships that are focused on mutual trust, mutual understanding, and mutual respect, regardless of what our relative roles are in the organization. You know. So would that be classified as a combination of level two, level three, where you're trying to kind of empathize and map it with your side, your experience? Probably, probably, because you're dropping out and you're, you're, well, you're maybe you're even dropping back into level one. You're, you're dipping back in and you're thinking, oh, what, what have I got going on in my head that's relevant here? And, and this is where, again, it's, it's perfectly natural to sort of dip between I am intensely listening and just taking it all in to, and I'm going back into my own memory banks and retrieving stuff. But it's just about being attentive to that and deploying, doing that intentionally rather than sort of as a habit going, yeah, I can see your mouth moving, but really all I'm thinking about is what's going on in my own head. 
So, so this, is, this is listening. I want you to think more about listening. The other part, there's, so, so there's two parts to humble inquiry. There's inquiry, which is about listening and asking questions, and we'll get to questioning a bit. But let's talk about humility for a moment, because this is another really important aspect of humble inquiry. We're going to talk about there are different kinds of humility. And uh, what I would like you to do at the moment at your tables, and if you are along the back wall, because this room is way more full than I thought it would be, find a group of three or four people you can talk to. And I want you to think about different kinds of relationships you have in your workplace. As you think about these different kinds of relationships, what I would like you to do, and um, with a smaller group, I get them to do it on stickies. I'm just going to ask you to do this verbally today. Is as you identify different kinds of relationships, what I'd like you to think about is, is that a relationship of equals? Or is it a not equal relationship? Okay, so I'm going to give you about two minutes to have that discussion in groups. What do we, well, that's my, I'm going to ask, what do you think an equal relationship is as opposed to an unequal relationship? I have ideas about that, but they not, may not be the same idea that you have. But where do you think you have interactions with people where you treat people as equals? Or do you have relationships with people where you see some people as being above you on some basis or possibly below you on some basis? But I'm not going to tell you what that basis is because that's really going to depend on your context. Okay? Two minutes. What kinds of relationships do you have? So, oops, that's not where we're at. Uh, so. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. We'll get there. Yeah. Awesome. I love doing this. It's like magic. I, I love the fact that everybody is talking. The fact that it's bzz, 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 bzz. it's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. And I feel I feel kind of bad interrupting you, but in interest of getting through this workshop, I kind of have to. So. Was every group able to at least come up with it? Was there any group where you're like, we can't think of any unequal relationships. Everybody at my workplace is entirely equal. Anybody want to put? OK, awesome. Because like, if that's the case, I would like to work where you work. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I'm just curious, where do you work, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, I work with an organization called Bank Data. It's a mm -hmm. Set up in India, which is in uh, Gurgaon. So we're people of hundred in number. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I was just I was intrigued because so many of the organizations that we work with are by nature very hierarchical, right? Whether it is rigidly defined in an organizational structure or whether it is defined in our heads according to some certain rules, and we're going to dig into those rules. Most of the workplaces we work in there really is a pecking order. There are some people who are more equal than we are, and there are some people who we perceive as being less equal than we are, and that often colors the way that we interact with them. So there's three, in, in the book Humble and Creed, Shine talks about there's three kinds of humility. Maybe there's more, but I think the three categorizations he offers are useful models. There's basic humility, which is hum humility based on um, kind of status that you just have. Uh, for example, the respect you might have for elders, for your parents or your grandparents, because that's just the natural of order of things. That is basic humility. Um, in a rigidly hierarchical organization, there is an expectation that people up here you know, are, 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 are to be respected by the people who are here on the org chart. And we don't question them and we don't treat them the same way that we might treat the people who are here or the people who are here. Um, so that's basic humility. Optional humility is that humbleness we feel in the presence of people who have accomplished something great that we're in awe of or that we really 
uh, respect or admire. So, you know, I, I have a thing about astronauts. So it's like when I meet an astronaut, oh my God, you, you went to space. That's optional humility. Or people who have, you know, made great the feats of intellectual ability or athletic ability or our favorite music stars or movie celebrities, the, the kind of humility that we feel that we are not worthy to be in your presence, optional humility. Um, here and now humility, though, this is the kind that we really want to cultivate when we're thinking about humble inquiry. It's the humility that comes from recognizing that we are dependent on one another. Regardless of the roles that we have in the organization, regardless of the positional influence that we may have based on our title, based on our, where our office is, based on how our seniority in the organization, it's recognizing that we depend on each other to get things done. And you might have knowledge, regardless of our respective roles in the organization, you probably have knowledge that I don't have. I probably have knowledge that you don't have. And in order for us to be successful, we need to pool that knowledge together. So there's those three levels of humility. Basic humility, optional humility, and here and now humility. Um, and I think, you know what, I think given, even though the room is kind of crowded, I'm, I'm going to make you do the wacky option for this workshop. What I'd like you to do at your table or along the wall is split into groups of three. And what I'm going to do is give you, uh, sorry, I'm just figuring out the logistics of this given that there are people lined up at the wall. Because actually what I, at your table, I'd like you to divide into three groups. If you are not at a table, find six or eight people and divide into three groups. And what I would like you to do in your groups is we're going to do a little bit of body storming. And this is going to be cozy in this room, but otherwise I'm going to make you draw and I'd rather do the body storming because I don't think everybody has a marker and a pen. Um, and by body storming, what I'm asking you to do is I'm going to give you a minute to create a scene that represents one of the three kinds of humility. So I'm going to get you to create with your bodies just a little tableau that this, you know, this shows an example of basic humility and how would you position each other relative to each other to illustrate basic humility. How would you create a scene that shows optional humility? How would you create a scene that creates here and now humility? Everybody was, will be doing this, so we will all be looking equally ridiculous together. <laughs> okay? So. Find at your table, break into groups of three. If you're along the wall, as I said, find a group of six or eight people to work with. In your group of three, or sorry, in your larger group, break into three groups. Each of you picks one kind of humility. Each of you creates the scene. You're only going to show that scene to the other people in your group. We're not going to go around the whole room. Smaller groups, I do that. This is too many people. Okay? But I want you to think about what does each kind of humility look like in practice. Okay? I'm going to give you like four minutes to do that at your table. Off you go. You could have a group of three. You might want to pair up with people at the back of the room uh, or, work, or join with this table. Join with this table is the best thing. So. Basic is something like a child to their grandparents or, um, you know, subjects to the emperor or something like that where it's just built, it's birth. By birth, this is an unequal relationship or by some sort of status that is kind of unchangeable. It's just who we are, and so that is the natural aspect of our relationship. The next level is? Optional. 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 And then here and now is when we depend on each other. So I am expecting to see everybody standing up and moving around a little bit. If you're sitting at your tables, I know you're not doing the exercise. doing body storming and making sometimes I do this with drawing but I'm like now nah, you got to get up and move around yeah, it looks great. <laughs>
Okay, so there's a minute left. I want to see some posing happening at your table. So did everybody at least get a chance to talk through what the different kinds of humility might look like, even if you didn't actually act it out? I was hoping for a little more drama, but the room is kind of cozy, so. so. But did everybody have a chance to think about what it looks like and sort of the different levels and stuff like that? Awesome. Okay. So what I would like you to do now Again, I think I warned you at the beginning, I'm going to make you do most of the work in this workshop. My goal for a workshop is for me to do as little of the talking as possible and for you to do as much of your talking and learning from each other. And what I'd like you to do is grab a pair, somebody at your table, maybe not the partner you worked with before, so find a new friend to speak to. And what I'd like you to discuss is think about people in your life that you admire and respect. Think about some of the people who you really, really feel that, that kind of human... Uh, who you have those kinds of admiring and respectful and trustful relationships with. And the question that I'd like you to discuss in your pair is what type of humility do you feel towards them of those three kinds? And how, what do you do? What do you do? What do you feel? What are the thoughts you have that expresses that kind of humility in this relationship? What are the behaviors? What are the how do you interact that reflects that kind of humility? So find a partner, and I'll give you a couple minutes to talk about that idea. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you can put your hand up and help. Awesome. Fantastic. It's okay. I'm not going to keep you I'm not going to keep you from talking for long. But now that you've explored that idea when you think about the people who you admire and respect and how you behave towards them, what I'd like you to do is have your pairs come together at the table and as a larger group the question that, that, that I'd like you to consider and discuss at your table is I want you to tie this back to the different kinds of listening that we thought about just a few minutes ago. And I want you to think about the people who you admire and respect. How do they pay attention to you and other people? What levels of listening do they demonstrate? How does that make you feel? So think about that. How does that listening tie to that relationship? and what's the feeling that it creates. I'll give you a moment to discuss that in the larger groups at your table. In fact, I will give you about two minutes. I think I'm good for time because we go to um, 5.15, right? Yeah, because 90 minutes, perfect. I'm right on schedule, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Rose, can he copy this like? Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Any aha moments out there about how there's a connection between listening and respect? Any observations that you want to share? So uh, let, let's hear from, let's hear from, you guys are pretty loud. Let's hear from somebody over there. <laughs> what was something you noticed? Yeah. That there's, I, I'm really surprised that I didn't think about it before. It's it, so simple. It, it, it seems so obvious, and yet we kind of forget that, right? And this is a critical thing. It's hard to feel, to respect or to feel respected by somebody who doesn't listen to you. So if, as leaders, we want to create a feeling of trust and respect, Maybe we need to focus on not quite so much talking and telling and a little bit more listening and paying attention. Any other observations that came up in your conversations? At the back. Yeah. So there's an interesting observation over here. Like I was listening and he was narrating his experience and uh, uh, I'm also giving information to me. So actually, as I was engaged in more listening, and eventually, I, I had nothing to say to him, but I was more listening. And eventually, I started asking questions because of the curiosity. And mm -hmm. that led to a lot more questions and a lot more information from his side, and which gave me a complete picture of that particular information. Yeah. So it, I started asking more questions. So I think that was the realization for me in uh, listening more to it. Yeah. In one way, asking the leading questions, leading questions from the side, right? So you get more and more information. Okay. So, so you, so leading questions like questions that drew you out, okay, not leading questions that were trying to take you in a specific direction, because that's where we're that's where we're going at the moment. But this is critical, right? In order to ask good questions that reflect true curiosity, that are opening up the conversation, we need to be listening well. We need to be listening respectfully, not listening to think about. What is my agenda here, and how am I going to drive the conversation in that direction? Because those are not the kinds of conversation that help build that sense of trust and mutual respect. When we think somebody is trying to drive us in a particular way, uh, that tends to create a completely different impression, I'll say. So I want to move into talking about questions a little bit, because this is the other half of that skill that goes with inquiry, listening but then expressing our curiosity through open questions that expand the conversation rather than shut down the conversation. So what I want you to think about for a couple of seconds, I'm not even going to have you talk about this in the group, but I just want to give you a couple of seconds of silence to think about what are the kinds of questions you get asked in the work that you do? And which kinds get you interested in conversation with the person who's asking them. So I'm just going to give you 30 seconds to reflect silently about what your experience of being asked things in your workplace is.
Okay, so now that everybody's had a chance to sit in silence, because it's been a pretty noisy room, and for introverts like me, it's like, ah, this is good. Um, I want to talk about questions for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to do an exercise. So there's many different kinds of questions that you can ask, and that we use all the time. Sometimes we use questions to express curiosity, but often we use questions to direct the conversation, or to show off how much we know, or to tell people how to do something, but we're trying to be polite about it. So we ask a question that isn't really a question at all. We do this a lot with our children, you know. Please, could you go and do something? That's not really a question because, or, you know, please could you go clean your room? Concrete example. That's not really a question because I'm not asking you if you could. I am telling you to do it. I'm just sticking a please on the front and putting a question mark on the end, but it's not really a question. It's a very directive kind of question. And a lot of the times when we ask questions, they are directing the conversation a certain way. They're rhetorical questions where I'm asking a question, but I, I'm not really expecting you to answer it. There are questions that are very diagnostic questions where I'm asking actual questions, but I am trying to direct a question down a particular path. Why are you doing what you're doing? Or have you thought about doing this thing? You know, um, there are questions, questions are often very confrontational and we use questions as a way of pushing our own agendas. Um, and we, Got, we need to get better. Here's me telling you. I'm telling you rather than asking you. Fail. Um, but what I would like, we need to get better at asking open-ended questions that reflect that sense of curiosity that you just described, that help us open up the conversation and share ideas about what's going on rather than telling each other, this is what I think, this is what I think, this is what I want you to do. And one technique that you can use, there's this idea that also comes from the coaching world about powerful questions. Powerful questions are questions that open up the conversation. They're not directive. They don't have a yes or no answer. They um, invite curiosity. And this is, this is Deb's powerful questions triangle, which is a useful tool to think about what makes a question powerful. Questions that are which questions or yes or no questions not ten, do not tend to be powerful questions. They shut down the conversation right away. Did you get this done? Will we deliver on time and on budget? That's not inviting a conversation. That's inviting an answer and probably the answer you think I want to hear. Questions that start with who, when, and where are often a little more opening. Um, who is responsible for doing this? Now, sometimes that's actually just a blaming question. Who am I going to go and yell at because things aren't going my way? But they're, they're opening up about what's going on here. Powerful questions, questions that really invite conversations, tend more, and I'm simplifying here a little bit, but tend to start with how, or what, or why. But why is a real double-edged sword? And I want to point out that it depends a lot on context, and it depends a lot on that relationship, and that sense of trust, and curiosity, and humility that exists between the person who's asking, and the person who is being asked. Because if we have a relationship that we feel that we are equally respectful, that there is a sense of equality in our relationship, if I ask, hey, why did something go wrong? Or how did that, you know, how did that issue manage to make it into production? We can probably have a respectful, helpful, constructive conversation about that. If I come along and go, how did that get into production? Where, do, you know, why did that happen? That's not going to invite curiosity. That's going to escalate defensiveness and shut down the conversation right away. So while wording is important, context, tone, the nature of the relationship is also very important as well. So a question that can be powerful in one context can totally shut down the conversation in another context. To explore the idea of powerful questions, there's an exercise that I'm going to ask you to do at your tables. And I don't know where the people around the room are going to do this, because you're going to need to find a flat surface. You can work on the floor. If there's enough floor space, you could work on the counter. Um, and I have a couple of extra packs of the cards at, up front. I also distributed two packs at most tables. So maybe what I'm going to ask is if you're sitting at a table, 
Rather than using both packs, if you can share a pack of the cards with a group that forms from the people who are standing around the room, um, so that they can work in smaller groups because they probably have less space, that would be a good thing. The exercise is very simple. You've got a list of, I think there are 12 questions in here, and what I would like you to do in your group is sort them based on what we've learned about powerful questions, based on how the question makes you feel. Sort them from what is the most powerful question in the pile, put that at the top of your list. What is the least powerful question in the pile? Put that at the bottom of your stack and then rank all the others in between. So I've got a couple more sets of cards and I'm going to start a timer. I'm going to give you about six minutes to do this. Okay. Does anybody else need? There we go. Okay. If there's another group around the wall that needs a pack, ask one of the tables if they can share one of their decks with you. So if as a group you're satisfied with the order of the questions, what I would invite you to do with the rest of your time is on one of the blank cards, take one of the questions that you identified as really not powerful at all and think about how you might reword it to make it a more powerful question. Now some of them you might not be able to fix, but maybe you can think of a better question to ask that would invite the kind of discussion that you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, excellent. Uh, as I was saying, if you've ordered them satisfactorily, use the remaining time to see if you can improve on one of the questions at the bottom of the pile. You can write it on, yeah, you can write it on one of the blank cards. Is there a way that you could ask this question that would invite conversation rather than escalate defensiveness? Okay. Just, if I can have your attention for a moment, please. Thank you. While you're ordering, we're not done yet, but I just want to let you know, if at your table you've ordered your cards, because some tables are still working on that, what I would invite you to do is take one of the blank cards in the deck or take a piece of paper if you didn't get the blank card and try to improve one of the questions that you put at the bottom. How might you ask that in a different way to invite conversation rather than raise defensiveness? The intent would be to expose whatever information this is trying to get at. Who is responsible? Yeah, yeah. So you still want to know who? Can we discuss strategies to avoid build failures? That that would be great because that probably that probably yeah, but that is not the same intent. Eventually, in conversations we might discover. But it might be. It might be right. Let's use a bit of generous interpretation here and assume that this isn't necessarily designed to make somebody go, I want to find out who's responsible, but it's like, I have a problem that we want to solve, and in my mind, the first step of solving it is going, well, how did it happen? Who's sure. responsible for it? But this is a much better question for getting at that, because nobody's going to feel attacked answering that, uh, asking that question. This question is going to make people feel, well, not me, nothing to see here, Everything, it's over there, go talk to them. Okay. 
Thank you. Oh, you guys are getting so good at this. Excellent. So hopefully everybody's had enough time to complete the exercise. Um, I just, I'm going to pick on you guys because you came and talked to me rather than asking the room to give me an example. What did you put at the top of your pile as a powerful or the most powerful questions? How can we make a schedule that meets the deadline? How can we make a schedule that meets the deadline? That's, yeah. that's a great question because that opens up possibilities. What did you identify as the least powerful question? You know, who is responsible for the build breaking? Yeah, who is responsible for the build breaking, right? That's a question that as soon as those words come out of somebody's mouth, everybody's going to start feel def feeling defensive. Just out of curiosity, how many people put that at the bottom of the list? Yeah, that's a common. Now, I want you to notice that not everybody in the room put up their hand, right? Because different people will interpret these questions different ways in different contexts, and other groups may have picked different top, you know, most powerful or least powerful questions. The reason that I wanted to use you as an example, though, is because I know from the conversation, you guys found a much better way to ask the question related to who is going, you know, who is responsible for the build breaking that might open up the conversation. And what was the question that you came up with instead? Yeah. Uh, can we discuss strategies to avoid build failures? Yeah. Can we, so if you couldn't hear it, can we discuss strategies to avoid build failures? Because that, giving it a generous interpretation, that might be the intent of this question. We're not blame storming. It's just that, hey, we know there's a problem, and we figure the first step in solving the problem is figuring out where does the problem reside so we can figure out who we need to work with. The difficulty is if you start at who is responsible for, chances are pretty good that people are going to go, not me. Go talk to those guys over there. You know? And we can't have a constructive conversation about it. Oh, can we discuss strategies to avoid build failure? It's pretty important. We're experiencing a lot of build failures. You're probably going to have a lot of people who are a little more receptive to, wow, that's something that's bugging me too. I would really like to help solve that problem. As opposed to, whoa, no, not me. Go look the other way. Nothing to see here. So powerful questions are a really important tool for encouraging curiosity, encouraging responsible uh, and constructive communication, and building that sense of mutual trust and mutual learning in an organization. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to Deb Price, who many of you saw on stage this morning, and Carlton Nettleton, who are the people who designed this exercise. This exercise is available from Deb's website. Um, and it's in the references. It used to be a bigger game, and I I think she's changed the URL. But you can go and download this exercise in a few different languages and use it with your teams if you find it helpful. So, so please do. And again, thank you to Deb and Carlton. Um, the other thing that I want to mention about questions, there's lots of resources out on the, on the web about powerful questions. And there's lists of them that you can download and you can practice using. Um, Roger Schwartz, who's one of my favorite authors, who wrote Skilled Facilitator and wrote a book, The Smart Leader, Smarter Teams, has a, has a rule about asking questions that I want to share with you because this is a good way to generate, to, to improve your ability to ask questions on the fly. If you're going to ask a question and you're a little bit worried about how it's going to come across, test it out in your head, appending the words, you idiot, to the end of it. <laughs> If this sounds natural, perhaps you need to pause and rethink the question before it actually comes out of your mouth. So that is Roger Schwartz's rule, and it has helped me out many times. I share it with you in hopes that we'll help you out. If a question sounds good with you idiot at the end of it, it is probably not a good question. Or you need to at least think about your tone and your posture and all of those other things. So what I would invite you to do for a couple of seconds is just think about what you've learned about powerful questions. And I want you to take a moment and think about, is there a context coming up later this week or next week, if you're going to be at the conference all week, where you, in your day-to-day -day work life, could make use of a more powerful question to have a better conversation? Take a couple of moments to reflect on this and maybe jot yourself a note to remind yourself of your intent so that when you open your notebook next week, you can go, ah, okay, in this meeting, 
I'm going to come prepared with some powerful questions. Okay, so as we move into the last bit of our time together today, I want to explore a little bit, why is this so hard? Because it seems really simple. Listening carefully and asking good questions is a really effective way to build trust and build relationships and, you know, positive, positing, positive relationships between the people we work with. So why don't we do this? This is a really difficult thing to do in practice. If it weren't hard, none of us would be here right now. We'd be off having a beer or enjoying another con workshop. It's really difficult because a lot of our organizations are structured. I'm going to give you some of the reasons, and then I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk about what's going on in your particular context. But we have organizational, we have cultural biases in our society and our organization towards task accomplishment over relationship building. Particularly in North American business culture, we tend to view building relationships with our coworkers as completely secondary to getting stuff done together. And we're very, you know, we think, oh yeah, it's important to do team building, it's important to get to know our coworkers because that's what allows us to get stuff done. Not because, wow, relationships are really important, and maybe that will enable us to get stuff done, but relationships are really, no, no, no. We're going to get stuff done, so yeah, I've got to start being friends with my coworkers. Not a helpful attitude. Um, we tend to focus on individual achievement over teamwork. Teamwork That devalues relationships as well. Maybe my teamwork, team members are useful to me only insofar as they help me achieve my goals and do well on my performance assessment and help me move forward, right? That's a different attitude than, wow, we're all in this together and we depend on each other for success. And often there are organizational structures in place that reinforce that. Yeah, we want you to be a really strong team, but we are still going to assess your performance individually. Hmm. And then we're surprised about how that works out. Um, telling and demonstrating your expertise is often perceived as being much more valuable than asking. We rise up the ranks in our organizations because of how capable we are, how expert we are, how much we know. And to stand in front of a group of people and say, I actually don't know an answer. I think we need to figure it out together. That's not perceived as be great leadership. That's weak. How did that bozo get in that position if they don't know that? You know? Um, and that makes it really hard to have those kinds of conversation. Makes it hard for leaders in the organization, people who are in positions of positional authority, to demonstrate that kind of vulnerability, to show curiosity, because there's so many things going on in the environment that suggest that is not what we expect of leadership. We expect leaders to know all the things. Um, and there are lots of things built into, you know, cultural aspects, how our society works, where telling is expected rather than asking, or not sharing information either up or down the chain is expected. Uh, and it's hard to overcome those patterns. So what I want to do for a couple of minutes, is because uh, we've only got about 15 minutes left, is at your table, uh, uh, yeah, actually, at your table, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking at you for a moment. I want you to think about, in your work environment, what are the norms that determine how you relate to people who are higher in status or lower in status, or even possibly equal in status to you, but that makes it hard to assume this stance of humble inquiry. What are the things that are in place in terms of how your workplace works, whether it's rules, whether it's processes, whether it's how people sit? I could be any number of things. What are the things that are in place that would make it difficult to adopt a stance of humble inquiry on a more regular basis? And what are the strategies that you might use in order to help be, make yourself be more comfortable asking questions and building relationships with other people? Okay? So I'd like you to, I'm going to give you about five minutes to have that conversation at your table. 
what gets in the way? What gets in the way of being able to do this? What organizational barriers exist? What internal psychological barriers exist? Because a lot of this, sometimes it's external processes. Sometimes it's about how we think about the, the rules we invent in our head, right? So what are the things that get in the way of assuming a stance of humble inquiry? And come up with some ideas for strategies that you might use to get around some of those barriers, okay? I'm going to give you four minutes at your table to have that conversation at your table or grab a few friends if you're standing along the wall and have the conversation with them. Okay. Not and people show up as red. Mm -hmm. People feel that you know they're still being judged, they're still being monitored. Yeah. So even if you want to be humble, but mm -hmm. that's what senior management who might not be agile mind might not have an agile mindset. Yeah. They might feel that, you know, that's leadership because you know you're driving across through this thing. So how do you change that? that, that how do you that, deal, deal that's with tough because that? you have to coach upwards. So things that you might do in that context. Sorry, I second let me turn off the mic for a second. Um, It's hard to coach upwards, but the two strategies that you might take, first of all, is maybe help draw their attention mm -hmm. to how these kinds of processes are shutting down the flow of information that they need to be really informed about what's going on in their organization. If you can find ways to demonstrate that you want me to do this, but it's resulting in these consequences that are not what we want. How can we change the process? Um, I'll say my simpler kind of snarky answer is buy them a copy of Humble Inquiry and leave it on their desk. This is a great book about leadership. Or find a good blog post or something, but start the conversation about how we as leaders need to model if we really want to build trust, if we want to build transparency in our organization. It's not about being agile, it's about attaining better outcomes, right? Maybe we need to think about how we okay. present ourselves to the organization to take a different approach. Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So, awesome. Thank you very much for coming back uh, to the focus very quickly. I hope at your table you had a chance to identify some of the barriers that exist in your environments and to maybe share some strategies for how that you can work, you can work around them. To wrap up, what I want to do is share a couple of things that you personally can do. Because maybe in that conversation you thought about organizational structures. Uh, you thought about processes that need to change. You thought about, you know, there's stuff, rules that are beyond your control. One of the first principles of change that I have certainly come to appreciate more and more in my career is if you want to affect change, you need to start with what you do because that's what you can control. And so some of the strategies that you might use to sort of increase the practice of humble inquiry uh, in your day-to-day -day life and in your work life and maybe sort of spread it through your organization a bit, is first of all, increase your level of self-awareness. Pay more attention to how you're listening, how you're asking questions, and deliberately cultivate a stance of curiosity, right? Think about how can you show more curiosity and maybe strip out some of the assumptions and judgments that creep into the questions that you ask or the kinds of conversations that you have. Think about how do I build relationship with the people that I work with? Is every time I talk to people in my organization, I'm coming to ask them how it's going and when are things going to be delivered and how come that problem happened? Maybe I actually need to spend more time on just getting to know the other people in my organization 
as people and not in an insincere way because that doesn't work out very well but just think about how do we get to know each other how do we start to share information about who we are as people in whatever way that is appropriate in your context but focus on that relationship building um, and doing that especially when things are tense and anxious and people you know emotions are running high slow down a little bit put that effort into especially when things are stressful take a step back take a deep breath and think about how can I help to build relationship here how can I focus on getting to know people and not just focusing on solving the problem because that doesn't tend to drive trust and mutual respect and mutual learning um, the most important thing though and I think this is for, for a lot of us we need to practice humble inquiry on ourselves. Sometimes the worst conversations we have, the most task-focused conversations we have, are the ones in our own head with ourselves. Why didn't you do that? Wow, you know, that you idiot rule? The little voice in the back of my head asks a lot of those you idiot questions. And taking a step back and thinking about how do I practice humble inquiry on myself? How do I develop a better relationship with myself and become more curious about why things are going on the way they're going on in terms of how I think and the decisions that I make? That's a really good place to start. And then you can think about how do I apply this to my relationships with other people? So just to um, recap really quickly, I'm going to go back to that slide. Humble inquiry, it's the fine art of drawing someone out of asking questions to which you do not already know an answer, because in that case, maybe a question isn't appropriate, and building a relationship based on curiosity and interest in the other person. Because relationships is how we build trust. It's how we build mutual respect and mutual learning. And it will allow us to become more effective together in dealing with complex situations. To do this, we need to think about our listening skills. We need to think about what else is going on in our, our environment that is reinforcing inequalities in how we interact. We're not going to eradicate systemic things that, that sort of uh, result in unequal status, but in our day-to-day -day interactions with people in the workplace, regardless of what our respective status is, how do we treat each other more equally respectfully, listening well, asking better questions so that we can build learning together. Asking better questions, that's key. So I would really encourage you to think about how can I come prepared? Print out a list of powerful questions and have them on your phone or tack them in the back of your notebook and practice them. I would encourage you, if there's one experiment that I would invite you to try as a result of this session, Think of a good question, take one of these or do a little bit of research online and find a different powerful question that appeals to you and find three ways you can just drop that into conversation next week. Maybe in a meeting, maybe in hallway conversations, but start to build that reflex of asking questions that show curiosity, that invite vulnerability, that really focus on building that relationship. Um, so I would encourage you to think about how can you use that next week? Just to wrap up, I just want to share, I will make these slides available on the conference site, but if you want to learn more about this, buy the book. I think there is a newer edition than the one that I show in the slide. I think Edgar Schein has put out a new edition with his son, but it is an excellent book. It's a quick read. It's easy to read. I think it's only five chapters long, worth every minute. If you'd like to run the powerful questions exercise with your team, um, I'll update the URL actually because this is her old URL, but you can download this kit and other information from Deb's site and very easily run this with your team, whether it's with a team or you know, with a leadership team to start people thinking about how do we ask more powerful questions. There's also some great stuff at the Google, um, from the Google Rework site about how as leaders in the organization, what are the behaviors that we can practice in order to increase psychological safety in our workplaces. And that's very much all about humble inquiry. How can we create trust? How can we demonstrate vulnerability? 
um, and grow curiosity in order to build trust and build relationships in our organization. So I would like to thank you very much for coming out to play with me this afternoon. I appreciate your enthusiasm and your participation, and I hope you found this valuable. I really appreciate you coming out to spend time with me. Thank you. Thank you.